Mm -hmm. Earlier before the discu discussion started, you all were talking about Disney. And mm -hmm. my one rule is at Disney, I never pass a bathroom because I always go in, wash my hands, and empty my bladder. <laughs> rule of thumb, never pass up on a bathroom. Very good. Um, Dr. Guthrie, with heart disease being the number one cause of death in women, what are the early warning signs we should be aware of? Um, so, I mean, talking about heart attack symptoms, and I think we could all probably speak to this, but, I mean, knowing, and uh, most people know them, you know, an elephant sitting on your chest on the left side, radiation down to your left arm, up to your jaw, um, those are all signs of an impending heart attack and should be obviously looked at immediately in the emergency room. Um, but I think women do present atypically, um, and a lot of women don't know that, so they kind of push it off as, oh, I'm, I'm sick. And some of these symptoms can be epigastric pain, which is kind of pain right here, uh, that can make you feel nauseous or even throw up. So, you know, if you have those symptoms, you might think, oh, maybe this is the flu or I'm just sick. Um, so I think women, you need to be informed of that, which I think like we do as physicians and um, most women do know those kind of things. Um, but just being aware of that um, and just knowing that you can present differently from our male counterparts for mm -hmm. sure. I don't know if there's anything else. Yeah, I would say with most things, A, a good thing to know is what are my risk factors? What are the things that are already going on in my body? Do I have diabetes? Do I have high blood pressure? Have I had a lipid panel checked? Have I been keeping up with my regular health care? Um, it's a lot to do on top of everything else that women are juggling. And it can be a way that something could possibly be, be mean, being missed. So knowing your baseline risk factors at the start and kind of having a conversation with your healthcare provider about what are my risk factors for my age and for my other comorbidities um, is step number one. The second thing too is I, for anybody, if you've got a new symptom that, although it may not be super severe, seems to be coming out of the blue, um, is a time to just talk to somebody about it rather than be um, in silence about it or assume what it may be happening, particularly as we start kind of even getting above 35, 40. These are the times where I wouldn't want you to say, well, I'm not 70, so this couldn't be anything. I'd want you to be listening to your body at any point in time, but particularly if a symptom seems new and random, new, you know, kind of heartburn-like uh, things or pain in your neck or shoulder, it can be very atypical. And so you would not want to uh, ignore it. And it's pretty easy to check out. And that doesn't always have to be in an emergency room. If you're, it's Sometimes things can happen in re relation to heart disease that can come on during periods of exertion or immediately after periods of exertion. And so if that's something that is bringing on symptoms that you haven't experienced before, it's definitely time to talk to a doctor or healthcare professional. I would also say that it's persistent. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like a week to two weeks of these constant symptoms. And I say this because I have patients that come to me with anxiety and they, they present with similar symptoms. So, uh, you know, Erica, my heart is beating really fast. My chest is closing in. I have a tight jaw. My back is really sore. I'm having a heart attack. I'm like, you're not having a heart attack. Tell me what's going on in your life. Well, I'm really busy. My kids keep me busy. I'm busy at work. I'm like, this sounds more like anxiety. Uh, if those symptoms are coming on pretty just uh, randomly or just over time, but then they dissipate with relaxation, with exercise, with getting some sleep, it's not a heart attack. Uh, heart attack symptoms usually are very persistent and they last and they don't go away, they don't subside. So that is the main difference between uh, anxiety and um, having heart attack symptoms, I think. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say yes. And so sometimes it's called, I, don't know, I wish they would rename this, but like angina can kind yeah. of be this, it comes on and goes away, but it's going to probably be with ac activity. But again, I, I've had several patients where they have symptoms like that, and you're absolutely right, anxiety and heart attacks. And I think that can be one reason why people brush things off. They're like, I'm just stressed, um, which, you know, it can be both of those things. And it's important to at least be talking to somebody so that someone can kind of do the triage of, do we need to work this up or can we practice some some exercises that might help with anxiety and and some and address anxiety over this it's it's something that you know it'd be easy enough to kind of rule out and then know that we've got something else to to focus on i'd rather do that than miss it
And just to echo what Dr. Toll was saying, I think knowing your risk factors is really important. And mm -hmm. I think younger women tend to use their OBGYN as their primary care doctor. Mm -hmm. And and I think, I mean, I'm sure OBGYNs love to take care of heart disease, <laughs> but it's important to go see a primary care doctor. who That's what they do. Mm -hmm. They can, you know, look at your family history, say, you need to go get this test done, you know, before something bad happens, you need to get this lab work done. So I think that's one thing that we can emphasize to women in their younger years is to yeah. make sure you're keeping up with your, your health. Um, Whichever healthcare provider you feel comfortable talking to is always your first sounding board and it's their job as the person to who is receiving that information. If they need to direct you, just understand that they're doing it for your benefit. But if you're most comfortable talking to your OBGYN, they've got a lot of knowledge too and so they can kind of direct you if it's out of their scope or, or start a workup if they feel like it's necessary. Can I say that midwives do that too? Yes, they do. Yes. yes. Any, any healthcare professional who you're seeing regularly, absolutely. So we're sitting in the P3R boardroom and we are surrounded by these heartfelt messages of why people are moving. Um, I've seen because Lexi made me do it to because I want a smoking hot bod. Um, <laughs> you all are fitness enthusiasts. How do you maintain your fitness and deal with your everyday stress? Excellent question. <laughs> I just do, I mean, I kind of do what I enjoy doing. So I do, like I'm, we mentioned, I coach cross country. So like when I'm with them, I run, that's what I do. I run with the kids. I do whatever exercise they're doing. Right now, I'm not running as much outside, but I am going to the gym. I've been going to bar classes, but I'm doing whatever I can make time for myself. And sometimes that's doing a lap or two around the hospital. <laughs> and so I just try to make sure that I'm moving my body and that I'm feeling good, feeling good with what I'm able to do and making, making time to move for my body. I also don't have kids. <laughs> Yeah. So I have a little bit of more time than some other people. Yeah. So that's that's also a side note. Um, so I, I have two kids. I have a two-year-old and an eight-month-old. So finding time to <laughs> in between fellowship. I mean, it, it's hard. But I think what Erica was saying is you really need to make that time for yourself to be able to be a good mom, a good clinician, a good family member, a good friend. Like, I find the days where I just make time to maybe go do a Peloton for, like, 15 minutes, it just – makes my mind so much clearer it makes me feel better it makes me be more excited to do my work to go home to take care of my kids um so i think it's really hard to find time during the day when you're getting up really early to go to work and then coming home and going to your second job basically to get your kids ready for bed and cook dinner um but there's always that 15 to 30 minutes that you can you know make time for um even if it's for two to three times a week, you know? Mm. Um, and finding a good support system. I mean, I, I can't be thankful enough for, you know, I have a lot of family around who's very supportive, who can take care of my kids and, you know, give me time to do that. So that's also an important factor. Um, but yeah, so I, I like that suggestion to make yeah. time for yourself. Yeah. I'll be perfectly honest that there were times during my residency for OBGYN where no children, not even a partner, just myself. <laughs> Movement was not really happening just yeah. for what was going on in my life. But I also had to kind of give myself a little bit of grace and be like, I have an active job. I am like, you know, walking from sun up to sundown. I am lifting people. I am helping life come into this world. And so maybe maybe that's good enough. And so I think also if you have a particularly busy season to acknowledge that movement is really more around you and it doesn't have to always look like TikTok makes it look, um, then you can kind of acknowledge that too. Um, once I've been able to kind of adjust a little bit more to this season and this lifestyle, I've started to realize that anything that puts it in my periphery, like sometimes having a Peloton in the attic means that you will be moving more. Um, and so that's kind of how it balances for me. And I am incredibly extroverted and motivated by the community of movement. And so if friends are going to be hopping on a Peloton ride, if they're going to be doing a group class, if they're going to be going on a walk or run, um, then that really motivates me. And moving with my partner helps too. We like to cycle and um, so when the weather is nice and I get to enjoy this beautiful city on the bike trails, then that's a really nice way too. So things that you like, things that are gonna feel like a, that's gonna add more than just one cup of expending calories. <laughs> Uh, I set boundaries, so I have boundaries not just for others but for myself. So I set a specific time for myself to do what I know I need to do in terms of uh, maintaining uh, emotional, mental health. 
Um, I teach Pilates, so that's important to me. I show up for my, my students and I show up for myself. I run and I walk daily. Um, I go to Orange Theories um, a couple times a week and I have a, a workout partner. I have a really great running partner that loves to do trails. So we meet once a week and we do our trail runs together. I have a great Dane, so she needs exercise. So, you know, if, I, if it's a day that's a rest day or an active rest day, I walk my dog. And that is a workout because she's over 100 pounds and I have to hold her physically uh, and and walk very fast with her because she's got very long legs. Mm. Um, and then I try to engage my kids as much as I can too. My daughter's very active. She's a gymnast. My son loves to run and walk. And so we do things to make it functional. I think at this stage in my life, functional fitness is what I can sustain on a regular basis. Uh, there was a time when I could go to the gym seven days a week and do CrossFit and do all the things and you know uh, that time has passed <laughs> so I keep my life and my movement and my activity and my my support system I keep them uh, very close to me and I keep it very functional um, the, the last question we had was is there a secret to the best movement for women but what I'm hearing overwhelmingly from all of you is the core mission of P3R is to just move, whether it is Pilates or taking your dog for a walk or, or if you just count your steps within the hospital. Yeah. The best movement is the type of movement you'll do. If you're going to choose a movement to help you age gracefully, some core strengthening and the ability to kind of, as I always say, you want to be able to do a squat to be able to get up and get down um, to maintain that core strength. And that's a, it can seem like a low bar, but it's an important bar. It's talking about, you know, your stability and your core strength. Um, and that can come in a lot of different ways. But I would say that just moving in general and whatever consistent capacity works for you in your life is going to help you towards that goal. But as we approach menopause and the changes that kind of come with that and trying to age as, as gracefully as we can all hope for, being able to kind of maintain some core and hip stability and strength is really important. Yeah, no, I was going to say, as, as far as joint health, I think any type of movement is is great. Um, you know, people with osteo osteoarthritis, you know, they don't want to move because it hurts, but once you start moving, it helps because it lubricates your joints. Um, and certain movements are better for arthritis than mm -hmm. not, you know, low impact things, swimming, cycling. Um, but I think for, you know, our younger populations, any movement is great for your joints, great for your mental health um, overall. Very good. Well, thank you so much for your time. You are all amazing women and proof that prioritizing your health and wellness can be accomplished with everyone's busy lifestyles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us.